I'm Jared Harding, the Senior Vice President of Client Engagement at Sanger Folkman, and I'm always humbled to share the microphone with the legendary Jack Zanger. Thanks for being with us today, Jack. Thank you very much. Nice to join you, Jared. So today's topic is back to the future of feedback. Feedback has played a very important role in the past and will play an even more important role in the future. And it will take a very concerted effort on the part of talent practitioners to focus on the fundamentals to really create meaningful feedback experiences for individuals that add up to impact across organizations. So that's what we're gonna talk a little bit more about today. So before we jump in, just a word about Zanger Folkman as a firm, if you're unfamiliar with us. Uh, we work with some real smart people here at Zanger Folkman, don't we, Jack? We do. <laughs> I mean, even Jack and Joe just <laughs> alone by themselves have experience uh, that other firms would really struggle to match. So really what we're interested in doing is, is taking all of our collective experience and expertise, taking all of the, the global data and insights that we've crafted over the years, we want to put that at your fingertips. And so this idea of your vision and our mission is that we help our clients know their leaders better, maximize maybe technology investments that they've made. Um, we want to help them realize the vision they have for leadership in their organization. So we believe our role is in the discovery and development of leadership strengths that empower people and organizations to thrive. So a partnership with Zinger Folkman is really about how do we help you win the day? How do we help you do more of what works and less of what doesn't for your situation, your goals, and your leaders? So on to our topic today. So the growth in HR tech has really been um, amazing and, and literally uh, this sort of big bang on the scene even just in the last five years. So just in Q1 of this year, there was $1.75 billion invested into HR tech companies from sort of this venture capital standpoint. And why that is kind of a neat stat is because that's twice as much as, it, as was invested in the same time period last year, and that's 60% more money than was invested the entire year of 2017. And so there really is this sort of spike, this sort of growth explosion of HR tech right now. People are investing it. There's a lot of startups, a lot of people finding solution. I mean, there's literally an app for everything in HR now. And so how is this sort of big bang in technology changing our perception of feedback? So specifically regarding feedback, there really has been a lot of positive advancements, right? Uh, now almost every HR platform available has some sort of feedback features built in. But even outside of these platforms, hundreds of tools are available to collect and deliver feedback. Um, it's become a lot more on demand, more intelligent, available on mobile, gamified, all of these sorts of things. But there are some ripple effects that we also need to be aware of. And, and so the key question becomes, how are we ensuring that technology is enhancing feedback? It's adding value to the experience and all of that together is sort of making a difference in the organization. All right, so Jack, help us understand why you think it's easy to be distracted by so, sort of all the neat things coming out and the importance of, of focusing on some of the fundamentals. Well, I do believe that uh, new technology often kind of comes across as a shiny object that is very dis can be very distracting. And I guess what we'd like to do in the next few minutes is to talk about what are those basic elements of feedback that we need to be sure we are preserving. And not only what are the basic elements historically, but are there some possible refinements and ways we can improve our, our understanding and our approach to this general topic? So uh, I'd like to begin by just talking about when we use the term feedback, I think we all instinctively know that if, if you say that word to a large number of people, uh, most of them kind of wince because it's been often in, uh, understood that feedback is, is going to be criticism, it's going to be evaluative, it's going to be corrective, uh, and people kind of feel like the, you know, it, it's, it's something that's going to be painful. Uh, we'd like to kind of propose maybe a new way of thinking about it because, indeed, in a recent article in the Harvard Business Review, uh, Marcus Buckingham and Ashley Goodall 
kind of basically defined, you know, that, that feedback was a fallacy and that, uh, it's a, that the cover of the magazine talked about it being a failure. And it was largely because their definition of feedback was that it's all criticism and it's all negative and it's, it, it evokes very negative uh, human responses. My definition of feedback would be a very different one, and that is that feedback is some information that one person possesses about somebody else, which they, they believe, if, if the other person understood, would be of benefit to them and would help them. So that means that, that much of the feedback that, that occurs and, and, and we know that should occur uh, is praise, it's affirmation, it's, it's recognition. Uh, and when we, we, we think about the broader meaning of feedback, and the purpose of it, I think we begin to kind of really get to the basic fundamental of, of what, uh, what we're trying to achieve overall. So I, we, we want to talk about just the fundamentals of feedback, and maybe we're going to just talk about it in three big buckets. Uh, one is the, the importance of, of the relationship between the two parties who may be conversing with each other. Uh, secondly, the, the idea that maybe we can greatly alter how well feedback is received by how it gets initiated, and primarily we're going to suggest asking for feedback. And then thirdly, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the, the skills required and wh how we might get people to be better prepared to engage in this feedback process. So let's begin with the first one, uh, the relationship. Uh, we're, we're wanting to just reinforce the idea that a healthy feedback conversation is not between a parent and a child always or, or people in power positions versus people who are below them in the hierarchy, but that the best, the best feedback is really between two adults uh, conversing in a very constructive way uh, about some way to improve the future. Uh, and, and therefore, it is the nature of the relationship that makes a huge difference. And, and one of the things we know about coaching, what we know about the feedback uh, process, is that it's, it begins, of course, with the foundation of what's gone on in the past between these two people. And therefore, the more positive, the more respectful, the more caring that relationship is, the more likely it is to be a positive discussion. And, and the, the fundamental basic of it all is that it's a two-way street. It's not just one person passing information to the other, and particularly passing it, quote, downward, uh, but that it really is ideally this, this mature conversation that has the motivation to help and not always to evaluate. You know, I think it's interesting that um, the, the article that you referenced earlier about the fallacy of feedback, you know, kind of talks about the givers of that feedback as sort of being more this egotistical, misguided, counterproductive delivery of, of feedback of this very, uh, you know, of criticism yeah. or whatnot. And so I agree and, and really like this idea that um, it, it's a coming together um, with helpful information to improve the future. And you can do that without egos, and you can do that without um, uh, it being counterproductive. Okay, let's move on to the second uh, big element, and that's how do we increase the amount and how do we increase the level of acceptance? And, and I think if you were to ask 100 people for, for their answer to that question, most people would say, well, Certainly one thing you can do to increase the amount is to encourage people at in every level in the organization that if, if you want more feedback, the simple answer is ask for it. And if you could get people to just re request feedback, you know that you're going to greatly increase the amount. Uh, and at the same time you increase the amount, that, that simple act of asking for it then greatly increases the level of acceptance, uh, how much people, you know, will, will respond to it, understand it, and will be inclined to implement it. So we are going to make a particular uh, point uh, in just, just a minute here about the importance of managers not only being good givers of the feedback, good providers, 
but that they set the example for the entire organization by asking for feedback from their subordinates. And I'll show you in just a moment kind of a slide that sort of shows the, the data that we have about just how powerful that is. Uh, as we kind of talk about that, though, let's just think about what it, what it does when a, a manager turns to his or her subordinates and asks them for feedback. It clearly sets the example, clearly talks about the fact that it, it clearly communicates that nobody, no matter where they are in the hierarchy, uh, they can get better and that they can benefit from information that comes to them from their colleagues. Um, one of the, the basic criticisms of, of feedback, and again, this very often feedback evokes kind of negative emotions in people. But boy, that would go away greatly if people asked for it. Uh, and so the, the idea that um, the, by asking for feedback, not only it's not just a matter of measuring how many messages are, are, are given or how much they're understood, but it's the real measure of the value of feedback, we believe, is in how many messages were acted on, how, many people, how much of that was really utilized. Uh, so um, if, you, if you change how feedback is initiated, if it's not a surprise, if it's not a manager kind of uh, catching a person kind of uh, off guard, but it really comes as a result of people asking for it. We think it changes it a great deal. Well, let's just show you this one interesting slide on what happens when leaders ask their subordinates for feedback. Now, as a prefacing comment, we know that leaders who are good at giving feedback indeed are 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 more respected than those who aren't good at giving, giving, it, giving it. But this, this slide measures one of the items in our 360-degree feedback instrument asks the question, does your manager ask for feedback? And on the horizontal scale, you're seeing responses in terms of the, the degree to which your manager asks for feedback. And it's being plotted against how that leader is perceived in terms of his or her overall leadership effectiveness. And notice that on the left-hand side, the least, th those managers who are seen as being least prone to ask for feedback are at the 15th percentile, whereas on the right-hand side of the slide, you see those leaders who are prone to ask for feedback the most are at the 86th percentile. Digest that for a moment. Just imagine how the culture would change in your organization if managers set the example by asking frequently for feedback from their subordinates. What do you think, Jared? I mean, it'd, it be, do? it'd be amazing, right? And, and you know, I think about um, a post I saw on LinkedIn, I believe. But it's you know, if, if there's if there's more truth spoken in the hallways <laughs> than in the meeting rooms, right? Then you've got a problem and, and how s sometimes that's so true, um, but how much that can be avoided um, with, with managers taking some of that initiative. And, and, I, and it is scary, but it's much more scary when it's a surprise, as you mentioned, versus yeah. where if you are a manager, boy, you have that opportunity to sort of take some control and, and receive that feedback. Right. Okay, the third, the third just general topic that we'd like to kind of discuss about how, make, how feedback can, can be improved uh, is the whole idea of people being more skilled. And, and here, I, I guess I want to introduce one more dimension, and that is when we think about this, we would often think about it being skill in giving feedback. And I'd like to, to emphasize that there's, there's two kinds of skills. Uh, one is the skill in giving, but the other is the skill in receiving feedback. We have a, a good friend, colleague, uh, Kevin Wildey, who came to one of our conferences a year, year or so ago and talked about how do you help managers be more coachable? Uh, how do you help them to, to learn to, to be good at receiving feedback? 
Um, imagine what the, the program Dancing with the Stars would be like if only one of the parties had had any training in dance. <laughs> <laughs> you know, how good is the feedback discussion going to be if only one person in the, in the conversation has been prepared for it? And yet, the reality is that for feedback conversations, we basically haven't given any help or preparation or, or skill building to the receiver. We only talk about the giver. So my, my first point then would be, let's talk about, or let's think about how do you help people be more prepared to give feedback? Secondly, to receive feedback. Now, the other point we'd like to make about that, and that is that, that the research would, would indicate that we often think of the receiver being uncomfortable, but the reality is that there have been some interesting studies done that when people give feedback, they're equally as uncomfortable as the <laughs> receiver. In fact, if not, if not more so, because they've been kind of brooding about it and thinking about it for, for, for a period of time. Uh, we believe that giving managers, giving colleagues in the organization some skill building experiences that help them to have a, have a framework that they can follow in, this, in the feedback process, a path to follow. Uh, and that framework, Ken, as one of our colleagues says, can be a, a framework, not a cage, but it, it really is nice to have a general track to, to follow the, the, the stages and steps of the conversation so that you have a general idea of where you're going, what you want to accomplish, and you've, you've had a chance to think about this and get comfortable about the conversation. Everybody is so so busy with the, with the day to day and and getting things done and we avoid the things we are uncomfortable with and I think sometimes we just think we can wing it and on on probably both the giving or receiving end yeah. and even just a little preparation even just a little awareness around you know a good model to follow a good framework to have can pay big big dividends in terms of of the outcomes of these kind of conversations. And the last basic, I guess, that I'd like to just raise, and that is that uh, people who give feedback to each other can really help that process go smoothly if they realize the importance of setting some context for the conversation. Um, when you go to a movie and you, you see, see things about to happen, often the, you, you get a warning about whether this is going to be a happy cheery, joyful event, or whether it's going to be kind of a scary, somber, negative kind of experience. Uh, and there's a background music that plays that kind of lets you know. In, in human conversation, there's no such background music playing. And uh, if you elect to sit down with somebody and, and talk with them and you, you indicate that you've got some information you think may be helpful, it really helps to know if this is something that's just a little suggestion that's not consequential. Uh, you know, it, it's better to use a, a, a black or a blue marker rather than a red <laughs> marker or yellow <laughs> marker uh, versus, you know, you're, you know, not meeting deadlines can be, you know, kind of really er eroding confidence, confidence and, and it may impact your long-term career. So I think there's just a, a way of, of setting the stage and framing the conversation that can be enormously helpful. Well, those are some, those are some elements that we think uh, are, are valuable as we think about the, this fundamental feedback process. Yeah, so w what we want to do next here is sort of say, you know, it's not really one versus the other. Um, and so how do you kind of experience the difference? What does that look like as you sort of use the, the focus on the fundamentals and use technology to sort of create this, you know, enhanced feedback experience. So I want to start off with this little story that the military was having a problem and they had soldiers in different parts of the battlefield and, and these soldiers could not communicate directly. And so the military needed a device uh, that could assist in sort of the coordination of maneuvers and flights and attacks, et cetera, with all of these soldiers that 
that uh, that couldn't communicate directly with with each other out out in the battlefield. And so the requirements that they placed on this sort of technology that they needed, it had to be hands free. It had to be luminous at night. And given the conditions of the battlefield, it had to virtually be unbreakable. And so as you think in your mind and, and sort of trying to imagine, so what what could this technology be? Um, the big reveal is that what we're talking about is what we think of as the wristwatch. <laughs> or back in the 1900s uh, during World War I, they called it a, a trench watch. And what was interesting, I think, just about, about this story is it's kind of fun to think how um, the wristwatch sort of came into popularity because it was based on this need of the military. And you think at the time pocket watches were... Uh, were, were the instrument of choice, but you didn't have yeah. you didn't have the ability to pull a pocket watch <laughs> out and kind of check things. And so this idea of manufacturing a wristwatch that could meet these criteria um, uh, sort of sort of launched wristwatches into uh, into being more, much more popular. So uh, I, I like this sort of analogy because when you think about it, you know, wearable technology today is I mean incredible. It's projecting to sell in the hundreds of millions of units and tens of billions of dollars. And, but a lot of it is, is sort of based on some of this fundamental criteria of what you know, wearable technology even needed from back in the 1900s. And what's interesting is no one today would say, no, I'm not interested in that smartwatch because, well, wristwatches are just an old idea. And yet, one example that we want to use in sort of this, the fundamentals of feedback and technology have can really create a great experience is with 360 degree feedback instruments. And 360 degree feedback instruments sort of do get a bad rap a little bit sometimes. I think people are, are maybe a little bit too quick to say, well, that's just an old idea. You know, I, I'm not really interested. Um, and our point of view is that, that these types of instruments are really a proven tool. The combination of uh, the fundamentals and technology um, can help us build really valuable feedback experiences, um, specifically around this kind of an instrument. So let us just tell you a little bit about what we have, to, have attempted to do in terms of bring, bringing to this uh, technology that's been around and could be seen as just being a commodity, how we've kind of tried to make it uh, akin to a, an Apple IV watch, I mean, in, in bringing features and benefits to it. Uh, number one is we've tried to make it empirical, uh, rather than items that we just pull out of the, out of a long list that we think sound good. Uh, we've tried to select in an empirical way those that we know differentiate high-performing leaders from not so high-performing leaders. We secondly have tried to create a more precise scale, rather than people responding, you know, do you agree or disagree with this statement? we've tried to create a scale that would spread out the responses a little more precisely. We've asked people to think about, is this an outstanding trait this person has, characteristic of the top 10%? Is it a strength, characteristic of people in the top quartile? Are they good at it, competent, capable? That's a, that's a three, kind of, do they need a little bit of improvement? Or does it need significant improvement? We think by giving a more precise scale, we can get more accurate responses. The third thing we've done is to kind of report data back to people in a way that we hope is aspirational. We've wanted to show them then how they compare to people who are average, who are in the top quartile, how they compare to people who are in the top decile, uh, because we don't want people to aspire to be just, you know, well, I'm above average. We want people to aspire to be similar to those in the top quartile or the top decile. We've tried to uh, show them the, the impact of their behavior on their, you know, currently. So we've asked the people who are the subordinates or direct reports to respond to five questions that, that really tell how the leader's current performance or behavior is impacting them. Uh, we've, we've wanted to kind of provide a way to diagnose in a more profound way kind of both strengths and weaknesses. Uh, and we, we have a strong philosophy that for 
a large percentage of the population, probably a little more than 70 percent, uh, they should be focused on, on, on their strengths. But that means that there, there is about 29 percent of the population who possess some behavior that really is getting in their way. And therefore, uh, how do we help them identify that? And through the written comments, rather than asking for written comments that would be any suggestion for making you a better person or a better leader, we're asking people to focus their comments on, does this person possess any fatal flaw that really is getting in their way? Tell us about that rather than having a long <laughs> laundry list of how might you be a, a more effective um, human being. So, you know, those are the, some of the kinds of things. So we've, we've been very concerned about data security and confidentiality, and so a, a, a good 360-degree feedback instrument in today's world needs to be very, you know, very robust and very, very secure. Um, when you ask organizations to engage in this in a broad-scale way, it needs to be a relatively short, very efficient instrument uh, to avoid survey fatigue. Uh, and then we want to be sure that the report is easily understood by a, a mere mortal. We don't need a PhD <laughs> uh, psychologist to interpret the results. It needs to be understandable for, for the layman who is just reading this report. Uh, and we believe that's very possible. And finally, the, the, the link to the development planning process. I mean, the, the, the purpose of this whole feedback endeavor is to give people information that they can use in their development planning. So creating practical ways to tie development to the feedback report we think is really crucial. And those are some of the refinements that we've seen built into a, to the more sophisticated feedback instruments. Yeah, so there's this you know, phrase we're all familiar with. If a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it, does it does it make a noise? And if you sort of have a great tool, but you're missing um, the, the elements that can really help with behavior change, do you actually have a great tool? And so with all of these enhancements, um, it, it's really what you can build around it to help make these things meaningful and make the experience impactful. And so we, we'd like to share a video with you, and we don't usually share this sort of um, promotional marketing type videos um, within, within our webinars, but this one is unique in that it's one of our clients, and he is sharing his personal experience um, with the Zanger Folkman 360 feedback instrument. And so as we watch this video, I just invite you to notice how he highlights some of these elements uh, that Jack has mentioned, you know, enhancements to the tool itself, but as you listen to the results of his experience, it, it, it was really the overall experience that created the impact for him personally. So we're gonna go ahead and play this video now. And my first experience with the Zinger Folkman Extraordinary Leader 360 process was back in early 2017. And I remember having a really difficult time wrapping my mind around the idea of focusing on developing a particular strength. I knew the process made sense. The data spoke for itself and so I decided to just sort of trust the process and over a couple of weeks settled on focusing on inspiring and motivating others to high performance. That was my year, a year of, of trying to grow that competency. I looked for opportunities in each project to take that competency, that differentiating competency, to another level. In 2018, I got an opportunity to reassess. It was about 12 to 14 months later. When I got my reassessment results, not only had I grown significantly into the 90th percentile in the area that I had focused on, but along with that, four other competencies had lifted significantly. In the Zinger Folkman Extraordinary Leader Program, they often talk about how differentiating competencies move in clusters, that a lot of the things, that they appear together in the data. That really happened for me. I was blown away, I was floored to see that dramatic of an improvement in the way that people perceived my leadership 
as a result of a real laser focus on one particular item. The other thing that I found unique to this process alongside the, the strength-based focus was just the richness of the reporting and the data. I hadn't seen a report that was as clear and focused but also as deep as this report. 360s in general can be a powerful instrument, but the Zinger Folkman Extraordinary Leader 360 is going to give them both the clarity of information and uh, the walk-along tools to help them make really powerful choices about where to set their focus and where to develop. The particular partnership that we've developed with Zinger Folkman and the way that they've come alongside us to create a plan that works for our people, it really is a positive experience. And we're seeing more and more eagerness to jump in and take part in it as a healthy part of leadership development. People are eager to come work here in an environment where their leadership and their strengths can be leveraged, capitalized, and developed to the next level. You know, we often have said around coaching that the success of coaching is not how the coach feels, but it's rather, you know, more appropriately measured by the changes that the coachee elects to make. And uh, I would say that similarly, the success of a, a 360 feedback experience um, should really be measured by the changes the participant uh, elects to make um, rather than by all the nuances of the tool presented. These things are important, the technology components, but it's um, how are we really um, enabling behavior change to take place regarding the, the tools that we use. Uh, so I was listening to an HBR IdeaCast the other day, and, and the gentleman on the, that was being interviewed had mentioned 360-degree feedback instruments and how he was a fan, but he said, but it's what you build around it. What can you build around it that's going to be impactful? So the first element here is involving others, and, and there's a lot of studies that have been done that demonstrate the benefit of involving others in your own development plan. I mean, if you, the idea is simple. If you share your plan with others, it creates a level of accountability that you're not going to get otherwise. And um, luckily, technology has made this sort of sharing um, of the development plan and involving others a lot easier. Um, one particular role that's important is the manager. And, and manager involvement is important because the manager is in a really unique position to um, increase the perceived value of the development experience because they can, uh, they, they're aware of the daily activities, they can help connect the development goals to the company's overall plan. And, um, and so they're in a really unique position to help the individual um, uh, m you know, make an impact and, and achieve success in their development plan. There's this really interesting study done in, back in the 1930s with this company called Hawthorne Works in Illinois, and they were trying all sorts of experiments to see what would improve employee productivity. They changed the lighting, they changed people's compensation, they moved workstations around, they uh, you know, made workstations super clean, and, and sort of what's now called the Hawthorne effect was that a lot of these changes did result in increased productivity, but for short periods of time. And sort of what came out uh, of this was that the result was less about the variable of the experiment, whether the lighting was bright or dim, and it was more um, of the workers responding that someone was showing interest in them. And, uh, you know, the ideas of mentorship and coaching and, and managers showing sort of this interest in people's careers and in their development um, can have a significant impact um, on the success of others, specifically, you know, using the 360 feedback experience to be able to grow and develop and improve. You know, and it strikes me, Jared, that there's, there's two separate effects almost. One is that by involving your manager and by talking about your results with your direct reports or other people, you, you clearly are getting their personal assistance and help in your development. But at the same time, it's also a sustainment tool, and it's it's mm. a it's an on yeah. it, it, it's an ongoing process in time that is then more likely to have you bring about 
a profound change. The second thing we want to talk about is, is uh, this function of, uh, of 360 providing people information about their strengths. Uh, and I would also kind of say that along with their strengths, what it does is it points out their weaknesses. You know, when you, when you do this, you can be doing it with two different objectives. One, is, one objective is we want to help every participant get better, you know, a little bit better or somewhat mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. That's one objective. Second objective is, as an organization, we're very concerned about filling our leadership pipeline, so we're very concerned about creating some truly extraordinary leaders to lead the organization in the future. For that second group, we would probably say it's really important that they become aware of their strengths and that they maybe focus on their strengths. But let's not forget that, that first group, that we're trying to help everybody be a little bit better. And so if there are indeed nearly a third, 29% of leaders who possess some, some distracting behavior that's getting in their way, don't we want to help them define what that is and know what to do about it. Uh, the next item is really about context. And a significant criticism um, of leadership development sort of overall is that it doesn't do a very good job um, of acknowledging the situation or, or the context in which a leader operates. And leaders can sort of be inspired and motivated in the moment. Um, but we all know that, that you know, truly effective methods of, of driving personal change recognizes um, the importance of how an individual interacts with their environment. And in, in sort of the Zenger Folkman 360 feedback experience, we utilize what we call the CPO model. The C, your competence, and P, your passion, are elements that, you know, maybe sort of come naturally and that we're able to talk to, you know, what are we good at and what are we excited about? Um, however, we, we often forget this last piece, the, the O, and we invite leaders to consider that organization need. How can you leverage you know, your skill set, your strengths, your passion, what you're excited about, but to fill an organization need. And if you, you think about that, when you're doing something that you're good at and you enjoy doing, and that activity is having an impact, you are a happy person. You're loving going to work, you, know, you, you, you see the benefits, where absent of that context, you could be really good at something, be incredibly excited about it, but if there's no impact, if there's no sort of recognition, uh, boy, that could fall off really, really fast. And, and there's uh, you know, maybe no engagement and, and there starts to be sort of burnout and these kinds of things. So understanding the context and really helping leaders um, add that element in as a part of their overall experience um, is going to help them focus on taking you know, significant advancements in their leadership. And, adding this sort of context and providing clear models that will help them evaluate you know, their role, their position in an organization, and aligning all of these elements together is um, an important piece of building around this sort of 360 degree feedback experience. Okay, the next thing we wanna talk about in terms of helping to kind of make that bridge between the 360 feedback instrument itself and how people develop a, a development plan that really begins to be, to be implemented. One of the discoveries that we made was this idea of cross-training. That for every competency that someone wants to develop, there are often a handful of other behaviors which are statistically significantly correlated with that. And so let me go back to the thing I'd said earlier. Uh, if, if you have a leader who is really working hard to become ever more effective, who has a lot of potential, clearly cross-training is often used by the most elite athletes who are really pretty good to start with, but they wanna do a variety of other things to become really outstanding in their, in their sport. And so the idea of cross-training allows someone who's really good to become even better. And this, that approach applied to leadership is particularly applicable to our, our high potential leaders. At the same time though, we found that, uh, we've seen that people who have a, a serious kind of fault can often benefit from those cross-training recommendations. It helps them to overcome that serious weakness. 
So this new approach to building uh, better behavior can apply to those who are building strengths and as well to those who are working on weaknesses. So the next one here is sort of one of these elusive ones that we, we continue to talk about, but it's how do you sustain momentum? And um, we recently wrote a white paper emphasizing how sometimes the idea of sustainment sort of becomes this box we need to check or just one, of, one other step in a learning initiative. And that leader, leadership development itself is really more a, a, of a behavior change initiative. And in our paper, we invited people to sort of ask the question, how can I expand learning? How do I create the idea that the workshop or, or the coaching call or the feedback report, these are not, you know, this is not the peak of learning, but what follows is a, a journey and, and the pinnacle of, of learning um, is really something to, to attain. And so we, we need to create the conditions for leaders to do their best learning again and again. And um, I really like what Jack had mentioned when we were talking about manager involvement you want a great way to, to sustain momentum. Manager involvement is a piece that's in place that can really drive, um, really and drive that over time. Um, and, and, you know, this, in today's day and age, I mean, there's so many technology tools to help us track goals and, and offer support and, um, and, you know, access to things like social networks and, and these kind of things. And there are other things, you know, do, do you create team development experiences? Um, most likely it's going to be a combination of multiple things. One of the successful tools we've um, implemented uh, in the Zanger Folkman 360 feedback experience is what we call the pulse check survey. And this, I'm sure you're all familiar with, but you know, simply it allows participants to select and receive feedback on a very focused set of behaviors that align with their personal development goals. And so then in this sort of quick turnaround, on, on getting that feedback on these behaviors for the goals that they're currently working on. It allows them to see them if they're making progress. It allows them to understand, do they need to make sort of a crucial pivot if they're going to be successful with their development plan? Are they working on the right things or do they need to make some adjustments? And so there's a still, still a lot of work to be done in this area, no doubt, of, of sustaining momentum, but continuing to apply tools and take advantage of opportunities to expand learning is really fundamental to the overall experience, um, specifically with, with 360 degree feedback. The final topic we'd like to talk about has to do with flexible delivery. So I guess at the, at the worst end of all this, it would be that uh, we occasionally hear of organizations who make a 360 degree feedback process available to their managers. They have them select their respondents, They they a feedback report is prepared, and the company mails it to them, uh, and they receive it sort of, you know, in the in the mail, and they get this, and they read through it, and they um, kind of, I guess, ponder its findings, and then they put it up on the on the shelf or in a drawer, and and that's it. Uh, we we think that's kind of malpractice. Uh, we think that it, the whole process deserves a lot more than that in order to, to really take advantage of its potential. So through a, a variety of, of possibilities, it can be a, a day-long workshop, a half-day workshop. It can be uh, internal coaches, external coaches, peer coaches. Uh, but we're seeing just a great deal of flexibility in the way 360-degree feedback is delivered but this, this ability to kind of make sure that there's a strong connection between the inf information de derived by the instrument and people's personal development planning and then how they go about actually implementing that, that's the key to making the, the feedback instrument into a truly major development experience. Overall, we are sort of exploring um, the idea of what this, this explosion of technology has sort of created and how a focus on the fundamentals can create meaningful experiences. And it's also very important for us to receive feedback. So I'm following Jack's advice and I'm going to be asking <laughs> for feedback now. And this is very important to us with these webinars as we do these every month to be able to get your input and your insights 
into what we're talking about and, and future things that you might like to have us talk about. So today, the um, feedback survey is, uh, you can see the link there on the screen. We'll also provide just a clickable link in the chat window. Uh, but the link you type in, and this all has to be lowercase. It's bit.ly slash zfjune19. And so if you will go there, um, and we'll leave the link up so that you have the opportunity to go take that, and we will be giving away 10 copies of our book, How to Be Exceptional. And so we encourage you to go participate in that survey and uh, give us some feedback. Thank you very much for participating in today's uh, webinar. Uh, we reaffirm that w we do not believe that uh, feedback is a fallacy. We do not believe that feed feedback uh, is going to fail. Uh, we believe that it has enormous benefits to people. Uh, the basics are what really count. And we're pleased to see the advent of technology that will greatly help in the collection of the data, but it certainly will never serve as a substitute for the real substance and the fundamentals of good feedback. Organizations need to be more inspiring, more human today than ever before. And that's really just to meet the needs and, and expectations, really, of the people that are making these organizations successful. And we believe that success in the future of work regarding people strategies will come from important combinations. Things like the, the focus on fundamentals with the enhancement of technology. Things like what we talked about around um, 360 degree feedback, which is having proven tools combined with powerful experiences. And the organizations that are the most successful with that will, will be able to handle sort of all of the unknowns um, that are gonna approach us in, in the future. And finally, thank you to you, our audience. Thank you for spending some time with us today, and not just for your time, but, but thank you for uh, being interested in these kind of topics, and thank you for wanting to make your organization and the future of work more inspiring for everyone.